Welcome to episode 31 of the House of Jordans podcast. I'm Christina. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Christina's PC, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-S-P-C. And I'm here with... Brian, you can find me on Instagram at Jodin Cards, J-O-E-D-I-N Cards. And I'm here with... Chris, you can find me on Instagram at Chris underscore H-O-J. You can find me on Twitter at House of Jordans. You can find us all on YouTube at the House of Jordans YouTube channel. And make sure to follow Nick, the video producer of the show. He's on Twitter and Instagram at Stiff Arm Wax. So here's a preview of today's show. First, we're going to recap the last two episodes of Christina's Corner. Then we are going to do a MJ collecting review four years out. Four years of collecting MJ. Last week, we reviewed our Luca PC. This time, we're going to do MJ. And then finally, we're going to have an analysis of the two and a half dozen Michael Jordan cards that Brian sent to auction with PWCC that are ending this Sunday night. All right. But before we get into the substance of the show, we have a quick announcement. Yes, this is our announcement. Congratulations to the winners of the 1K sub giveaway. We want to give a, send a huge, huge shout out and congratulations to Mike D, the winner of the 2018-19 Prism Cello box. He was the last name standing after we chopped down the list from 464 names down to one during our YouTube live stream. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Shout out to J. Hoden Cards for pointing out how appropriate it is that a mic won the House of Jordans giveaway. <laughs> uh, we also want to congratulate Milan, a.k.a. Kobe East Coast, on Instagram, Tup Dyke, and Louisa AV on winning House of Jordans mugs. Congratulations, guys. And thank you, everyone out there, for supporting our show and subscribing to our channel. See you guys again for the next giveaway, which is coming very soon. We're already brainstorming. Mm, what do we have in right. store? What do we have in <laughs> store? Now, uh, let's get to the substance of the show. First up, Christina's Corner Recap. So, this week, we're going to recap and react to the two Christina's Corner interviews that came out on the House of Jordan's YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, on Thursday of last week, we had Matt, PSA collector, who appeared on Christina's Corner, episode number five. Uh, Matt said that his role and responsibility as a hobby content creator in the hobby was to educate and welcome with open arms. I thought that was a great philosophy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he said, and I quote, that he is there to allow everyone out there to enter the hobby and know it's a fun place. It doesn't have to be about breaking the bank or you don't have to enjoy collecting by spending hundreds upon hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. I'm trying, he's trying to educate everybody and let them know that collecting cards is about collecting cards. It's not about who has the best cards. It's not about who's been doing this the longest. It's not about who has the most cards. It's not about any of that. It's just about community. And, uh, it's open to everyone. There's no restrictions. There's no right or wrong way to do things. And if you want to get better at it, all you have to do is do what he does and research, research, research. Very well said. Yeah. Uh, he has put in a lot of time with uh, researching uh, and putting a lot of energy into figuring out how to use the algorithms of YouTube and Google to his advantage. And he figured out how the system works and he's putting that system to work for himself and his channel. Uh, he gave some great tips. And what I liked most about that interview was that he said that his wife is his number one fan. <laughs> That's great. You know, something that he drives home in those statements is that the hobby is definitely all about passion for the hobby. Because if you don't have the passion, you're not going to do that research. And if you don't do that research, you're going to get smoked. And then secondarily, the hobby is about having fun. And because if you try, like like he was saying, if you try to make this a competition where like, I'm trying to have the best PC, I mean, you're going to get killed. There's been guys who have been collecting nonstop for the last 30, 20 years and who picked up stuff at pennies on the dollar for what it sells for now. And then there's guys like that. And then there's guys like, you know, very wealthy collectors. There's some very well-known wealthy collectors who put together unfathomable collections that will probably never be matched because they've got the resources and they've been doing it for so long. So that really is great advice. And it shows that the hobby filters out 
people who don't have humility and who don't have passion and who don't want to put in the work because they're going to burn out in the face of what the hobby landscape looks like right now. So that th- those are some deep comments. I agree with what he said. Yeah, definitely. And I think something just taken from that is that you build your own PC and that's like your PC and everybody's PC is different. It's like unique, you know, nobody has the same set of cards that you do. So that in itself is kind of, it shows like who you are as a collector and like what you like. So I think it's cool because you can kind of show off that part of your personality through your collection too. I agree. What was the uh, other interview that you did? The other interview I did, which came out uh, Tuesday of this week, was episode six with Emma Bachelieri, which is who is a Sports Illustrated staff writer. Uh, you might be wondering, who is Emma Bachelieri? And why did Christina interview her for an episode of Christina's Corner, which is her new show? And yes, I'm talking in the third person. She never gave her a show. <laughs> Um, but ignore that. And let me tell you, uh, let me break it down for you. Okay. On May 6th, the daily cover of sportsillustrated.com. Yes, I'm talking to you, Brian. <laughs> was an article about the hobby. Yes, our hobby. The article was entitled How the Internet Created a Sports Card Boom and Why the Pandemic is Fueling It. The article focused on the current breaking boom that HOJ highlighted in a previous episode, thanks to Brian. Uh, Emma happened to be in Dallas during the million card million card rip party, so she jumped at the chance to attend the Tops event. Originally, she pitched the story to be tied into opening day of baseball, uh, but she had to revise the article when sports went on hold worldwide. Uh, and she thinks that what takeaways from the uh, interview that I had was that she thought that she no she thinks she thinks that there's an opportunity for the hobby to be covered by more mainstream media news sources in the future uh, so I really enjoyed that perspective from a staff writer I do wonder what that pitch meeting looked like like hey I, I have know. an idea and she actually said she had been gathering research for this piece and attending I'm pretty sure she said she attended the tops party before she obtained yes. the art the the you know, authority, the green light, the green light yeah. to do right. an article. Yeah. So she was, you know, independently noticing that something interesting was going on. Then she had to walk into an editor's office or somebody's office and say, like, look at this. This is really cool. I have a piece about it. You know, I think we should do something with it. Or like, I have an idea for a piece about this. And they approved it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I understand that there wasn't a lot of sports related things to write about then. And so they like, approved it before. Uh, they approved it before that. They approved yeah. it to be tied into an opening day piece, like as an opening day piece. Nice. So they approved it to uh, like be on sportsillustrated.com dot com yeah. on opening day and tied into is, baseball's opening day. The, the hobby will have to compete against mm-hmm. fantasy sports when those come back, regular sporting events, regular games, and then all the highlight shows and analysis and recap. You know writing and coverage and stuff and like during this little interim you know there's been a a pretty blank canvas to fill in with different types of sports content and so like it i think it's an open question whether the momentum that the hobby has going right now can command mainstream attention going forward um but it definitely makes sense why it's you know gotten such a strong foothold right now especially because um something that we noticed like right away when we started looking at how um, the coronavirus pandemic had affected certain financial markets like crypto. We compared crypto, we compared uh, the stock market like the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, and we compared that to the performance of cards. For example, Michael Jordan card index that we created. And we were noticing right away, cards are not reacting the same way these other markets are. And then, you know, you get an article coming out the first week of May that's literally like how the pandemic is fueling the boom of the hobby. Uh, so th- something very, very interesting happened with the hobby. I don't know uh, if like the magnitude of that has really fully been grasped, how unlikely and interesting that is. But I don't know. I, I think it's an open book, whether an open question, whether, you know, the hobby will continue to have mainstream coverage once all the normal sports content comes back. Are you done taking over Christina's Corner before I get through? <laughs> 
I thought you left a little pause there for some commentary. Well, I think I'll just interrupt okay, real quick. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but no, but seriously, to that point. This is why I have my own point, new show. <laughs> to that point, though, I think people in the in the hobby now, there's new people in the hobby because of the fact that there is a break in sports. And my question will be, will those people continue to, you know, participate in the hobby and will they find that as a better outcome than maybe doing some fantasy sports or some fantasy bets? That's a great question, Brian. And luckily, Emma and I dive into that during Christina's corner. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yes. Well, I'll tell you this. People who came in during this moment and then who participated in Project 2020, like maybe they bought some of the early stuff, especially because there would have been a a likelier tendency for new people to buy into that product because there was a very conservative mindset um, amongst collectors and they resisted Topps Project 2020 Mm -hmm. and they were vocal about it. um, For a good 60 to 70 cards. Yeah, they were not... Baseball collectors were not impressed (laughs) by Topps Project 2020 when it first came out. But still, thousands of people were buying these cards because even the early print runs are like in the low thousands. It was probably a lot of newer people who were taking a risk on these cards and thinking about these cards. Or at least a substantial portion of those people were, were probably newer people. And then they're finding that all these cards that they bought for 20 bucks a pop, or less if they bought in bulk, have gone up 100x. Well, yeah, I saw someone on Twitter. He calculated uh, his return on tops, his the value of his Project 2020 cards, and it's valued now at over a million dollars, and he put in less than two grand. Yes, wow. that's a, that's something yeah. to think about. There are new cardboard millionaires being made. Literally, cardboard millionaires are being made from flipping Topps Project 2020. And you can look at like the um, Suzuki Ichiro um, that is selling for like 4,500 right now. That was 20 bucks at release. You can even look at Max, like 20 bucks. You can look at the one that that you made a post about on Instagram the other day. The Don the Mattingly. Right behind you? Yes. No, the Ted Williams. The, or, I mean, the Ted Williams. Um, By that, Fucci. That one you got for 20 bucks, and like the current market value is between like 1000 and 1200 right now on eBay. And that's one of the like the, the, the lesser cards in terms of appreciation compared to like even like the Ermsey Trout, which, like in my opinion, is the most iconic card made so far, and it probably will be. You know, I had somebody on Instagram, I, I sent out an Instagram story. I was like, this is the hottest card in the hobby right now. It went from 20 to $400 in like a few weeks. And he bought one at $400. And then he made a post uh, and he was like, yeah, now it's 2000 Like, thank you for bringing shout this card out, to Kiki. my attention. <laughs> <laughs> shout, shout out Kiki. So, I mean, new. the point is that like if new people came into the hobby and this is their first taste, yeah, it's going to be tough um, for them to leave. And eventually they're going to be disappointed. And compared to that, compared to that, I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, sometimes when you strike gold, you just got to realize it and keep yeah. going, you know, afterwards. But because, like, that to me, you know, you're striking gold when you're buying those tops cards before they actually hit and make a big wave, you Definitely. know. And, yeah. and it's taking that, but you know, people are taking maybe a smaller risk than normal, but you're experiencing it, and, you know, a big reward for people that, you know, they weren't even, like you said. People weren't embracing it at first in the hobby. Yeah. But then, you know, what happens? So don't follow always like... That's right. You know, no. The, the, follow someone else who gave yeah. you the advice on Topps Project 2020 I mean, as soon as she found out about you it. You were talking about Project <laughs> 2020. You were one of the very first people talking about it. You were like just buying up those cards. Um, I've only gotten four. I've bought like a lot of them, and that's four you're a, are the only that's ones. That I, I found out that you can pay for expedited shipping, but Miss Penny Pincher over okay. here, expedited shipping is the cost of another card. Would you rather have the card in hand? Yes, two days beforehand because they're still backlogged because they have to print all the cards, so they don't actually go out yeah. the next day after you purchase it. Or I can never would you wait rather to have a card. no? I'll, I'll, I'd rather have the other wait. card. I know, and you know when they. I think something that impacted this too is when they started coming in. Because when I saw them in hand, I said, mm-hmm. "These are slick. Yeah, these are impressive cards." And then I you, told you on I believe it was episode twenty six that I bought some cards. I remember. And you didn't yeah. even know. I, I remember. <laughs> and now the hobby is wise to it. The public is getting wise to it. Yep. Because. Uh, there was a Ken Griffey that came out this week 
that Keith Shores. Keith Shores that has just shy of one hundred thousand yeah. copies made. And for those who don't know, the print run is determined. There's a forty eight hour window to buy it. However many people buy it within that forty eight hour window, that sets the print run. And just, just to put shy into, of a hundred thousand copies. To put into Jeez. context, the previous print run before Monday's release of the of that card and its like brother card yeah. was thirty four thousand and change. Yeah. So it tripled yeah. in print run from the highest. And the second highest is the brother card that came out with Keith Shores. The Nolan Run. Yeah. And that one is uh sixty four thousand, I believe, which also if it didn't come out with the Griffey would have been its own record for uh like buy it now tops product. Um, and to also put in context, the Ted Williams that I was talking about, which sits right above Christopher with uh, no face Ted Williams, which I really enjoy this style, which is why it's still sitting there and we haven't sold it. Uh, that one has a print run of 1,131 compared to almost 100 grand. So, yeah. But yeah. even the, um, the Ben Baller Trout, which has something like 34,000 as a mm-hmm. print run. Last time I looked, it was selling for about 150 bucks yeah. on the secondary market, and it was 20 bucks or less at release. Now, here's the thing: people are making hand over fist thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, on their Project 2020 flips. And where do you think that money's going? Uh, that money's going right back into the hobby in a lot of these situations. Some people are saying they're buying houses with it, which I think is pretty cool. That's but, very cool. That'd be cool. Like, yeah. yeah. But you know, but I agree that that money probably is flowing back into the hobby. Once oh, you, I'm sure. You know, especially because you you're thinking, you know, okay, well, I'll just reinvest it, right? And you know, go from there. So it's a very interesting development. I think it will uh, have a trickle down effect because that money's going to get put back into the hobby, and people are going to be a little less resistant to high prices. Yeah. You know, if you just made a hundred thousand dollars on Tops Project 2020 in a month. Who cares if you pay an extra 500 bucks on this really nice card that you want? Yeah. You know, suddenly I don't think you're going to be so uptight because, as they say, you're kind of playing with house money. Now, people will still be disciplined. Yeah. You know, the market's not just going to completely loosen up, but, you know, people are going to be feeling good and the money's going to be flowing. Yep. I agree. Um, which brings us to episode seven preview of Christina's Corner, which is my interview with F. Dot, who is another of the Project 2020 artists. Uh, Christina's Corner premieres every Tuesday and Thursday night, 10 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget to stop by the live chat because uh, it's popping and come say hi to me because I'm hanging out there. <laughs> okay. Christina's Corner, by the way, doing exceptionally well. Yeah. Thank you. The hobby loves it. Yeah. Thank A lot you. of people love it. You, it's it's I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, next segment: Michael Jordan card collecting four years out. So last week, Christina and I reflected on showing off our Luca collection, having officially hit the one year mark of collecting Luca. And I received some positive feedback on that segment because people said they enjoyed seeing our Luca collection. Listeners have been on this Luca ride with us for the past year. And lots of listeners have been picking up Luca cards right alongside of us, right? And people said they enjoyed the transparency. They liked hearing about what we paid for stuff. Not a lot of people talk about that. Mm -hmm. They like to hear about what it's roughly worth right now. More people talk about that. (laughs) And the moves that we're making in the Luca market. That's, it's, you know, transparency, I think, is a good thing. It's fun. It makes the show fun. You know, we're all kind of (laughs) doing this hobby together, the friends of the show, the listeners, all of us. uh, and, And I just love hearing from people. I'm glad people liked it. So this week, uh, we're going to take things up a notch or two. We're going to go through our Michael Jordan collections. Now, first, Christina and I will show off our PC, which like numerically is you know the key cards. It's less than Brian's. Um, so the, and then Brian will show off his. So Christina, if you would please flip through this stack here of low end MJs while I give a little bit of background on our MJ collecting. Christina and I have been building our PC since June of 2016, and we started out very humbly picking up mint-graded copies of base cards for just a few bucks a piece. And what Christina is showing you right now is what remains of those early acquisitions. 
And I'd estimate that we've got about $1,000 in value here in total in lower end cards when she's run through the whole stack of them. In late 2016 and up through the summer of 2018, we ramped things up a bit. We picked up pretty much every 90s MJ insert in existence. And then we made a huge move in a different direction in the fall of 2018. We shifted our collecting focus to the grails. And we sold pretty much everything we had in chunks, consolidating our collection from hundreds of mid-range and lower-end cards into just a handful of high-end cards. Now, to this day, I'm still not sure if that was the right move. I loved having rows upon rows of gorgeous 90s cards to just flip through at my leisure. Brian still knows how that feels. (laughs) I'd spend hours going through those cards, but the fact of the matter is I really didn't have much of a choice the way I see it. Because once we'd built up enough equity in our PC that we could start essentially like trading it in for grails, it simply had to be done. Uh, That's part of how my passion for collecting works, and maybe collectors out there can relate to this. There's a certain feeling that comes over me when I see one of my grails come to market. Back when we first started out, I told myself, just forget about the grails because they'll never be within my reach. But when I realized that we had enough value in our PC that we could essentially like trade it in for some of those dream cards that I told myself I'd never be able to own, it was really only a matter of time before I started making moves to land them. There's just an excitement about landing a grail that can't be replicated. And landing those impossible cards is part of my motivation to keep on studying and finding new ways to improve as a collector. And... Different people have different grails. And what was a grail to me four years ago, in some cases, has changed. Yeah. And now different cards are grails. And that the concept of a grail will you know, always evolve as your collector tastes evolve and the stuff that you like evolves, etc. So it, Christina has completed the run-through of like our low-end pile here, last one. And now, Christina, please show this pile off to the camera as well please so let's just start quickly before we get to the the really exciting stuff these are not grails this is kind of an oddball set that i've been putting together um, over the last year or so it's not very valuable these are cards that are maybe 100 to 200 bucks each but the cards are serial number to 100 they've got shiny hollow foil great action shots and they tell the story of mj's greatest career accomplishments it's a 10 card set called Player of the Century from 1999-2000, Upper Deck Century Legends. That season, the 1999-2000 collecting season of basketball cards, it featured Upper Deck making a ton of MJ cards. And this particular subset, like many of them, just kind of gets lost in the sea of post-career Michael Jordan cards. But the positive aspect of this is that you can acquire super rare Michael Jordan cards for super cheap. And the only one that we're missing is card number 83 from this set. We have the other nine. And if you've got it, please, please let us know. I would love to be able to finish this set. And since I've got one duplicate in the pile there, we've got 10 total cards there. And I'd roughly guess that the value of all those 10 is about $1,500 total, give or take. So now that we've completed looking at those, let me mention the three biggest 90s inserts that have survived our PC, basically. And here they are. The first one is the humble 1995 Ultra Scoring Kings Hot Packs PSA 9, which you might remember we picked up just a few months ago here on, uh, and we discussed it here on the podcast. We we got it for $54, which was the cheapest price ever paid for that card in that grade just wow. a few months ago. A steal. And the card currently sells for around $125, which is down from its last dance right. uh, peak price. Next up is the 1993 Upper Deck Special Edition Behind the Glass insert in a PSA 9 case. I picked this one up off of eBay for about $65 back in January. The only recent comp is a BGS 9 that sold for about $200 last month. And then finally, there's the 1993 Ultra Scoring Kings insert in a PSA 9 case. I picked this card up for about $240 in November of 2018. And pro tip here, there's almost always a great buying window on Scoring Kings in particular, but also other mid-range MJs in between Thanksgiving and Christmas every year. never fails. 
Copies of this card were selling for over $2,000 in April, right after the Last Dance documentary's release date was announced. But then sellers absolutely flooded the market with these cards, which ended up driving the value of the PSA 9s back down to its current value, which is around $1,250. And that was kind of sad to me to see so many people willing to part with this card. Yeah. But this is probably a lot of people who also got this card for 200 bucks or less. Yep. And they said $2,000, you know, right. 1500 even. You know, they probably felt like they didn't. It, it was time to cash in. And they sure did. Yeah. And so the price, you know, is down substantially from where it ultimately uh, peaked at. And, and the trajectory of the card was, you know, uh, cooled off quite a bit from an oversupply. Now, there's lots of MJs that have had a massive surge in response to The Last Dance, not just this card. Um, and there's lots that have retreated in value after they surge. But there's also a lot more that are still going up as we speak. And we'll be doing a deep dive into the MJ card market and the impact of The Last Dance in a very, very soon forthcoming episode. All right. Finally, let's get to the heart of the MJ PC, our seven grails. You might be asking, what is a grail? Is there a technical definition of a grail? And there isn't one to my knowledge, but to me, a grail is a card that is very difficult to track down, is very limited in terms of print run, is beautifully designed, is an important part of hobby history, and above all, makes you feel like you just need it. Okay. So let's reveal some of our grails, and we're going to go from the least expensive to the most expensive one. So first up is the 1998 Ultra Platinum Medallion, numbered to 99 in a PSA 8.5 case. We got this card off of eBay last December, so pretty recently, for $4,000. And these don't come around often, especially at a reasonable price point like that. Now, let me get this out of the way. Because all seven of the grails we're revealing sell very, very infrequently, I've used what I call the historically correlated multipliers methodology to predict their current value. Now, in a nutshell, the way this works is I take one or two cards that sell more frequently than the grails do, and I track their movements in value over time. So, for example, the two cards that I used to figure out the value of this particular grail, the 9899 Platinum Medallion, is the base version of the card and the gold medallion version of the card. And then I locate the most recent sale of the platinum medallion in the relevant grade, which in this case was August of 2018. I figure out what the base and the gold medallion for were selling at that time, and I calculate how many multiples more the grail was then. And in this case, the platinum medallion multiplier was roughly 56 times, or 56x, with respect to a PSA 10 copy of the base, and it was about 11x with respect to a PSA 10 copy of the gold medallion. So I then apply these multipliers to the current sale value of the base and the gold medallion, average the two resulting values, and that gives me a rough estimate of the market value for the platinum medallion. There's more that goes into this, but like I think that's enough math. Uh, that's as much math, definitely, as a podcast can handle. So back to where we were. We grabbed this platinum medallion, like I said, for four grand last December. The historically correlated multiplier approach suggests that the current value of this card is 62 hundred dollars second up is the 97 98 ultra platinum medallion number 200 in a bgs9 case we got this card from a friend of mine dave aka the hobbyist 23 on instagram we paid seven thousand dollars for it back in september of last year 2019 and that was a very strong price to pay then but i was on a rampage to find this card after our buddy coleman cards showed me his tracy mcgrady platinum medallion one seller tried to lure me in when he found out how badly I wanted this card. And he kept trying to lure me in to pay more and more and just like dangling a price in front of me and then jacking it up on me. Ugh. And I got tired of the cat and mouse game. So I just went to Dave and I was like, here's my offer. Take mercy on me. Yeah. And he did. And uh, here the card is now. Safe in our PC. Uh, the historically correlated multiplier approach suggests the current market value of this card is $10,000. Third is the 1998 Fleer Tradition Classic 61, numbered to 61, in a PSA 9 case. We got this card in a cash and trade deal with another hobby buddy, Michael, a.k.a. The Shrug MJ 23 on Instagram. And this deal happened back in April of 2019. 
And long story short, he got one of his grails in the deal for me. I got the classic 61 from him, which was definitely a grail of mine. And the value of the deal at that time was $6,000. The historically correlated multiplier approach pegs the value of this card at $11,500. Fourth is the 1998 Skybox Molten Metal Fusion Titanium, numbered to only 40 in a BGS 8.5 case. Even though I didn't get this card from eBay, this particular copy that Christina has in her hand right now and is showing to you guys, this is the only copy of this card to sell on eBay in the last 13 years. It sold back in November of 2016 for $5,100. I saw a collector make it available for sale on Facebook for $16,500 in January of 2019. And what could I do? I had to buy it. <laughs> so we met at a Santa Monica antique show and we did the deal. And the historically, co- the historically correlated multiplier approach estimates the current value of this card to be $27,000. Fifth is the 1997-98 Finest Gold Embossed Refractor numbered to 74 in a BGS 9.5 case. Now this card showed up for sale from a Chicago seller fortuitously at exactly the same time that we happened to be visiting the Chicagoland area for the holidays back in December of 2019. We met the seller at a police station and we handed him $13,500 for the card. The historically correlated multiplier approach suggests the value of this card is about $35,000. Sixth is the 1998-99 Skybox Premium Star Rubies numbered to 50 in a BGS 8 case. This one first showed up for sale with a seller located in a small town in Minnesota. And my brother, the legendary Stiff Arm Wax, graciously went and met up with the seller and delivered $18,500 in cash to him, picked up the card, and shipped it to BGS for us to get it graded. The historically correlated multiplier approach pegs the value of this card at $50,000. Finally, we have our true holy grail. The 1997 Metal Universe Precious Metal Gems Red with a print run of 90 in a PSA 5 case. We met the seller of this card at a car dealership a few hours away from where we live. We gave him $20,000 cash, and this was way back in September of 2018. Uh, He bought a car, and we walked away with a piece of cardboard. The historically correlated multiplier approach pegs this card to be $115,000. So all told, the cards we have remaining in our PC, um, we spent about $88,000 on them at various points over the past four years. And we have roughly $272,000 in current market value. All right. So that's a lot of numbers and a lot of math. But there are some important things to keep in mind with respect to these value estimates. So first of all, these valuations are all unrealized gains. It takes effort and patience to liquidate these types of cards should you want to go that route. Second of all, these are value estimates of cards that very rarely record public sales. So I've tried to use a rigorous and objective method to assess the values. But the fact of the matter is these are just estimates. These are obviously open to disagreement. Third, these are value estimates at this point in time. And the card market, and the MJ market in particular, it can always change. And as we've seen over the last few months, it can change very rapidly. So bear in mind, whenever you're watching this, that these values are just rough estimates, snapshots, as of May of 2020. And certainly, a lot can change. Okay. That is our MJPC. Now... Let us take a look at Brian's MJPC. Oh, yeah. So as we get things kind of sorted here, I have about, I think, uh, maybe like 30 cards here um, in my PC that I'm about to show off to you. So first up, we have the 1993 uh, Michael Jordan Topps Finest Refractor. Um, I bought this car raw and it graded a PSA 9. My initial investment in it was $350. Um, and I actually, now the price of the card would be estimated at about $2,100, which is pretty down from the high of it uh, during the last kind of dance craze. So 
uh, interesting price point that it's at now. Um, the next card up, we have the 1993 Michael Jordan Fleer Ultra Scoring Canes. This is in a, BG, uh, a BGS 9 case. Um, and I bought this card raw for $150. And now the estimated value on this is about uh, $1,250. So, not bad. Those are two huge, like, raw wins. When you yeah. buy a card raw <laughs> for a couple hundred bucks... And then a mid grade is like comfortably in the four figure range now. It's not bad at all. Um, all right. Next card up, we have the 1995 Flare Anticipation. Um, now, this is a PSA 10 grade, and I bought it raw as well. Uh, I bought it for $200, and now roughly they're selling for $475. So. That was your first, right? That's your first MJ? That is my first MJ. Um, you know, not necessarily the biggest gainer, but still, I just love it. It's got that Andy Warhol look to it, and it's it a does. great piece of art, I think, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. It's a really cool card. Um, all right. Next up, we have the 1997 Metal Universe base card, and this is in a BGS 9. Um, so currently, this price is around $600. I uh, bought this card for $20. <laughs> um, so... Not a bad grade, and it's down a little bit from the highs. We've talked about you know this card previously, um, but I don't know. I just love this card so much. So I love it so much that I even have da 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 coming up next a PSA eight <laughs> copy as well, which is currently going for around two hundred fifty dollars. So down pretty significant from the high that we dis- discussed on this uh podcast mm-hmm. i think it was around 450 or so yep um but for that card i bought it for 60 bucks so not bad all right next up we have the 1995 flare new heights so i bought this card raw graded a psa 10 i bought it for 135 dollars. you bought it in a pack too. i bought it in a pack so i knew it was fresh it wasn't you know one of those sitting there for I don't know how many years, just in a penny sleeve. Yeah, because the way those packs work from that product of Flair, they're in a box. Yes. And within the box is a see-through plastic wrapping. So yep. the sellers are going to take it out of the box, see, look what card is in the pack. Yep. And you snagged it. And, and I snagged it. Boom, PSA 10. <laughs> PSA 10, not bad. I'm so. noticing you a trend your here. Ghost Jordans. I love the Ghost Jordans. And that, <laughs> it's, it's that Andy one, Warhol thing. I love these Jordan flares. One Jordan isn't yeah. enough on a card for Dude, Brian. Those, those no. flares definitely feel a little underrated right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially from the artistic, I think, standpoint. I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I bought that 135. Now it's selling for 525. Um, next up, we have the 1998 Fleer Electrifying. This is in a BGS 9.5. Um, this card is currently going for 2500 and I invested $370 into it, so, or bought it for $370. So, not bad from a, you know, standpoint of grading it, getting the BGS 9.5. Uh, I really love the card. That's why it's in my PC. Um, definitely one of the earlier boys, too. So Yeah. It's a great looking guard. Yeah, it is. All right. So up next, we have the 1995 Flare Hot Numbers PSA 10. Um, currently, this card is going for about $1,500. Um, and, I, and I bought it for $510 and graded a PSA 10. So looks pretty sweet in that case. Love this card. One of my favorites. Yeah, Actually showed awesome. it off my top three, so. For sure. Definitely a great card. All right. Up next, after Christina shows it off, is the 1995 Skybox Larger Than Life PSA 9. Um, I bought this card for $25 initially, and now it's going currently for 650 in a PSA 9. Um not none had really sold recently because this is a very low pop card, um, so that value is estimated. But I think it's a pretty good estimate for that card. It's a gorgeous card. Okay, up next we have the 1993 Fleer Ultra Power in the Key. Now this is in a BGS 85. Um, I think it's a pretty good looking copy of the card. Um, I graded it uh, 
from the raw state and it was I bought it for 30 bucks and currently with the market value it's around 250 for an 85. All right. Up next, we have the 1997 Metal Universe Planet Metal BGS 85. This card is really hot right now. Oh, this card is on a tear. You know that the SGC 10 sold for 3000 and then a PSA, PSA 10, 10 sold for came along and just like 2500 or something like that. I think we more. have a more recent PSA 10 comp over 3000. Wow. Okay. So yeah, definitely a uh, a pricey card. I currently have the value for this because none have sold at about 700. You know, I don't know. You value it however you want compared to that PSA 10. Um, I initially bought this card for $167 and then graded it. So not bad. Um, I love this card as well. So definitely a PC card. Um, up next is the 1997 upper deck records collection. I bought this card raw as well. And it graded a BGS nine. Uh, we've talked about this card. You really like it. I know you think it's. Uh, I think it's one of your favorites. Oh yeah. Um, and I agree too from that kind of music standpoint. Yep. Yep. So, definitely a cool card. Bought it for eighty bucks. Currently selling for five hundred fifty. So, not bad. Um, up next, we have the nineteen ninety eight Upper Deck Great Eight. Now ninety seven. B- oh, ninety seven. Thank you. You're welcome. Um. And this isn't a great of PSA 10. I bought it raw uh, for $120 and current estimate for that value. None, none have sold recently. So I'm saying 1500 uh, One raw recently sold for sold for around uh, like 850 or maybe $890. Um, so kind of put the price at that. Um, up next is 1996 Michael Jordan. Skybox EX2000 BGS9. Um, I really like this card. I know you've owned the uh, the credentials, credentials parallel, parallel yeah. to this, One of which my is top beautiful five card. Favorite designs. Yeah. yeah. So this is the uh, base version of that. Um, I bought this card for forty dollars and great. Uh, actually, no, I bought this card for forty dollars in a BGS9. So um, and currently they're selling for two hundred and twenty-five. So I also have one up for auction which we'll talk about but that's a psa 9 okay next card is 1996 fleer ultra full court trap gold um so i actually bought this card from (laughs) you uh i believe it was in a bgs grade or something like that rcr rcr seven five it was okay killed by rcr didn't deserve that grade. no so i bought it from you i graded it got a psa 8 (laughs) <laughs> pretty pretty nice to see that kind of come up i told you though that i was going to be doing that yeah no of, of, course, of course so um of course. i honestly don't remember what i paid for that from you i think it was around 75 bucks if i remember correctly um and now none have really sold recently but estimating yeah. based off the base value i'd say this is about 300 for a Sorry, PCA. I, i've got a really nice raw sitting over there in my oh PSA i know i've seen it pile yeah i'm <laughs> yeah. coming back i got it i got mine for 45 so <laughs> i'm on the rebound there we go all right up next is 1998 skybox premium soul of the game in a bgs9 um this I, card has been really hot in the last dance and afterwards too it has it's uh it's it, it went on a tear i think it was upwards of a thousand for a B, for a psa 9 or something like that um it's cooled off a bit they're currently going for about 650 um i initially bought it for 195 so not bad at all um i just love this card it's a beautiful card and the cool thing about this card is the different variances in the colors for each individual copy the uh blue this on this card is blue green uh yellow red but that will change based on whatever version of the card you have or copy of the card you have yeah yeah that's one of the coolest features that set is how they switch up the color scheme on the different seems random just yeah i it's awesome no two copies are identical i suppose right maybe maybe they are i don't know but there's a lot of different color schemes out there yeah i like this color scheme because uh the blue bleeds into the yellow which creates Mm. the green at the top and then uh the yellow bleeds into the red which you can see creates a little bit of orange at the very bottom of the yellow and the top of the red Mm -hmm. so it's the three primary colors like bleeding into each other to create 
two other colors. So I, I really like this one. Yeah, it's a, it's a great card. Definitely a PC card. Definitely. All right, so up next we have the 1995 Skybox Premium Standouts uh, in a PSA 8. I bought this card raw for $23. <laughs> and of course you did of course um this card i I just love the the gold foil on it um but currently they're going for about 100 bucks so i decided i want to keep this bad boy um all right up next we have the 1996 ultra game board game board and this isn't a psa 7 i bought it for eight dollars um I thought it was undergraded. I just love the card. I've always kind of wanted a copy, and I know it's a really sensitive condition card, so I was like, whatever. I'll buy it for for eight bucks. Um, I don't know what this would go for now. Maybe anywhere from 30 bucks or so to 50 I don't know. really depends on whatever those are selling for. Um, all right. Up next, we have the 1995 Skybox Premium Meltdown. This is in a BGS 8.5. Um, I bought this card for $270, and currently uh, the market value for that is about $700. So this card also went on a pretty crazy tear. Um, there was like think, a BGS 9 that sold for an absurdly high amount. Yeah. 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 Like thousands. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure you know, what the price would be on this now. It's obviously a lot of cards have had their highs and lows, but uh, yeah, I peg it at about around there. Very difficult card to grade. Yeah. All right. Up next, we have the 1997 Top Stadium Club Hard Court Heroics. Man, I love this card. It's very unique. There's not really a lot of cards like this. Um, I bought it raw, and I bought it for $34, and... I graded at PSA 9, and it now is currently selling for about $300. So really like this card. It's finally kind of seen a come up, too, in the price on it. Um, and I think it's well-deserved, especially for how hard it is to grade. Um, up next, you have the 1996 Skybox and Net Assets. Um, I bought this card raw for $203, and I got it graded into a PSA 9. And currently, that's going for about $750. Um, so I have to start calling you the mint master. <laughs> <laughs> all these raws, just, all these raws just coming in minty. Yeah. I love buying the raw cards and great. It's, it's, it's fun. You know, it's a You're fun good thing. At it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this card's awesome. I love the die cut. One of my favorite for, uh, for MJ, I think. Absolutely. All right. Up next, we have 1996 stadium club high risers. Um, bought this raw for $43. Graded it and got a BGS 8.5, and currently the value on that is about $150, which, man, I think it's too low, but that's my opinion because I just love this card so much. Um, all right, up next, we have 1997 Flare Showcase Row 1, BGS 9. I bought it for $132. Currently, the price is about $250 for it. Really love the card. Very unique, uh, beautiful-looking card. Up next, we have the 1997 Skybox Rave Review. Uh, this is in a BGS 8.5, and I bought it for $975. And currently, I peg the estimate on this. It's a, it's hard to really tell. I would say $2,500, but a BGS 9.5 recently sold for $10,000. So I don't know what this... It's hard to value what this car would be if it's sold right now. All right, up next we have the 1987 Fleer uh, base card, and it is in a, I believe, yeah, it's a BCCG8. I think this is a pretty good-looking copy of this card um, and kind of based on a PSA 8, if I were to kind of cr- cross it over, would you say that would be a, a value of around $450? I bought this card for $150, so... I'll probably try to get this in a PSA case. Um, next card, we have the 1988 uh, Fleer All-Star. Oh, sorry. This is, that's not it. The Fleer ba- uh, 1988 Fleer Base in a BCC G9. Um, this card, I peg it at $300 currently, um, and I bought it for $150. Um, as you notice, as I go down the list, the the gains don't make sense because this is kind of chronological to how I bought these cards. So up next we have the 
1988 Fleer All Star PSA nine, um, and that is currently going for 300. Actually, this one I bought a while ago, and I bought it raw for 25. Great PS9, so pretty nice. Um, next card up, we have the 1995 Stadium Club Warp Speed PSA 9, which we recently discussed on this show. Um, I bought that for $325, and I'd peg it at currently about $350. Okay. Now, up next is the 1996 Topps NBA Stars Finest Refractor. Uh, this is in a PSA 10. I bought it for $310. And currently, they're going for around $700. So, really like this card. Um, getting down to the wire here, we have the 1998 Fleer Vintage 61 PSA 9. That's not or that. Actually, that's not it. There it is. There we go. Okay. No worries. Brian put them out of order again yeah. on me. Ugh, yeah. Sorry. He always does that to me. <laughs> I always do it. Just, <laughs> just screw <laughs> over. Just to screw me over. <laughs> I get on a roll and I'm like, okay, which one's next? Let me get the best angle. And then he's like, oh, just kidding. It's three behind that one. Let's go ahead, Brian. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I got this card for 75 bucks. It's currently going for about 130 Uh Really love this card. Kind of a parallel to the uh, one that you have but the base version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the subset, which also has a classic 61 parallel. Right. Awesome card. Um, all right. Up next, we have the 1993 uh, Stadium Club in a PSA 10, and that is currently going for about uh, $100, and I purchased it for 60 So I thought this card is just a really cool base card. Uh, I just love the action shot of it. Um, and then these last three I have here are the 92 Fleer, the 89 Sticker, we'll see if Christina has three hands here, and the Hoops Top <laughs> 10. Now all these cards together are about $200. Um, I recognize one of those also. Yeah, uh, I got, well you should recognize two because the, oh. the 92 Fleer you gave me and then the Top 10 I bought from you for 25 bucks. <laughs> um, and now that's going for about 100 so thank you. <laughs> so that welcome. concludes mm -hmm. my uh, PC. Now, with the totals all in all, the value of that PC is $21,365 with a buying price of $5,314. Okay, let's marinate on that for a second. Um this PC has been two to three years in the making. Yeah. Uh, I don't care if you're collecting Luka, LeBron, Giannis, the hottest players out. It's not ordinary to see a 4X return, um, let alone on Jordans, which are, you know, slower but more mm -hmm. steady growth usually. Right. The blue <laughs> uh, chip. Uh, yeah, the blue chip. Unless, like, all sports get suspended, there's a pandemic, and then a documentary rolls out for a month long that just pretty much makes the case for who the GOAT is, and in doing so, chronicles one of the most important cultural moments in the history of sports and documents the Beatles of basketball, basically. Right. So, so sometimes something like that happens. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, you know... Normally it doesn't, but yeah, yeah. still, though, to see a 4X... Yeah. That a, a lot of that has to be credited to buying high quality raws and grading them and getting good grades. Would you uh, agree with that? Oh, definitely. I mean, it is tough to grade cards well. Um, it is not an easy thing, especially with these older uh, cards. You know, compared to modern, you have cards that come right out of packs, you know, the main things you have to really worry about is maybe, uh, you know, the centering or something like that. The surface the damage. The surface damage. Yeah. Centering, um, you can say, like, modern cards itself, like, they have centering issues up to wazoo. Yeah. But the surface damage compared to modern cards, like, we've pulled them. Like, we've pulled those power and the key cards, and it's just, like, white spots everywhere is chipping from being stuck to the previous card. So, right. so the fact that you like 
buy these cards and then you gem mint them left and right it's well there's you, more you to it keen, than, yeah you have a keen eye yeah. for picking up raw cards and like doing your research on the card yeah and the individual card that's being sold um so props to you right thank you yeah. i appreciate it yeah it's tough to sift through you know you have to sift through a lot of raws a lot of listings um and a lot of it is about the timing right of you know getting that right one and 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 waiting for that so it's it's a fun it's a fun though you know that's the best thing about collecting and grading and stuff like that it's just it's a lot of fun you know yeah oh man especially when you're good at it like yeah (laughs) i'm not so good at buying raw okay last segment of today's show uh on a different note that was a celebration of our collections this note is a little bit more bittersweet because you sent about two and a half dozen Michael Jordan cards to PWCC. I did. In their currently running in, in round two of the current auction. So let's now go over those cards and, uh, you know, celebrate and mourn the loss of them. <laughs> I like I like the way you phrase that. So, yeah, I mean, I I basically cut the PC down the middle. And I kept cards I wanted in my PC. And then I had some that I just sent over to PWCC, um, currently up for auction, like Chris said. So those cards include a 1992 Upper Deck uh, Michael Jordan number 23, PSA 10. Um, and that value is predicted at probably, I think, around 230 that it will sell for. And that's based on previous comps. Um, and all of these predicted values will be based on those. And uh, mind that as it is, it is predicted value. There's no uh, ne- necessity to that. This is the value that the card will sell for. Um, the next card I have here is the 1993 Finest uh, Michael Jordan PSA 9. Um, so the baby brother to the refractor. Uh, this card, I predict the value to sell at about $225 based on recent comps. Uh, next card we have is the 1993 Ultra Inside Outside Michael Jordan number four PSA nine. Um, currently that card is selling for around $125. So that's what I peg it at. Um, next card I have is the 1993 Ultra Scoring Kings Michael Jordan. PSA 8, um, based on recent comps, I bet that this car will probably have a predicted value of around $700. Um, next card I have here is the 1993 Upper Deck uh, number nine, 193 PSA 10. Um, and that card, uh, based on recent comps, was around 400 bucks, or sorry, 40 bucks, which I actually purchased. And I would say that this card is probably going to go for, I don't know, maybe 75 bucks or something like that. Um, okay. Next card is the 1994 Finest Michael Jordan, number 331 and a PSA 9. Um, another classic card uh, following that 93 Finest. Uh, based on current comps, I would say this card should go for about $150. All right, next card is another base card. It's the 1995 Flare Michael Jordan number 15. I love those flares, and this is the one I chose to get rid of. It's in a PSA 9. Um, Based on recent comps, I'd say that card's going to go for around $100. All right, next card is the 1995 Metal Nuts and Bolts, and this is number 212, and it's a PSA 9. Uh, based on recent comps, I'd say this card is going to go for about $100 as well. All right, next card up is the 1995 Skybox EXL Natural Born Thrillers. Um, this card is in a PSA 9, um, and based on recent comps, I'd say my predicted value for this card is about $900. Um, one recently sold uh probably like a month or so ago for around $750. So um, this is a pretty rare card. So, and it's already at a pretty significant price at at auction. So I predict it to go for around that value. All right. 1995 Skybox Premium Larger Than Life. So 
this is a BGS eight. Um, it's a very well uh, looking copy of the card. The reason I bought the card was actually um, to regrade it, but I never got around to it. It's in an old BGS slab, um, but it's a nice looking copy. So I'm definitely whoever gets this one's going to be happy with the appearance for the grade. I'd say. Um, based on recent comps, I'd say that's going to go for about $150. All right, the next card up is 1995 SP Hollow Views, Michael Jordan. This is in a PSA 9. Um, I predict that this card will end at about $200, um, and that's kind of based on what it's currently at at auction, um, and we'll see kind of where it goes from there. Um, next up is the 1995 Tops Power Boosters in a BGS 9. Um, based on recent comps, I'm going to say this card is probably going to have a predicted value of around $300, maybe $250 to $300. Um, so, up next we have the 1995 Tops Top Flight Michael Jordan in a PSA 10. Um, now, this is a pop 17 out of 92. Um, based on recent comps, I'd say this card will go for around $400, um, in my estimation. All right, up next is the 1996 Hoops Michael Jordan, number 176. Um, based on recent comps, I'd say this card is going to go for about $125. Um, this is the Big Finish card, if uh, anybody might know what it is it as that name as well. Uh, up next is the 1996 Skybox EX2000 Michael Jordan PSA 9 Mint. So I showed off the BGS 9 earlier. This is the uh, brother to that as it's the PSA 9. And um, I predict that this car will probably land in about that same range, uh, $225 or so. Next card up, we have the 1996 Skybox Premium Michael Jordan number 16 PSA 9. Um, based on recent comps, I'd say that this card is going to go for about $125. Um, next card up, we have the 1996 Stadium Club Fusion Die Cut Michael Jordan in a PSA 9. Um, so this card is pop 5. There's only two pop, uh, there's only two 10s uh, as a, for a PSA. Um, so it's a pretty hard grade. Um, the recent comps for this card are uh, kind of, I guess, I'm not really sure what it would be. There was one that sold for 2450 but then I also saw one that ended at a prop seed auction for around 700 or so. I don't remember exactly because the listing was removed from, or it wasn't removed, but it didn't show up on watch count, but I remember following it. Um, so... Not sure exactly what's going on there, but I would say that this card, based on those uh, two data points, would probably fall somewhere in between the two, maybe around, you know, maybe 1000 to 1500 or something like that. All right, next card we have is a 1996 Topps Chrome Michael Jordan BGS 85, and this is part don't of... Don't buy this one. Yeah, don't, yeah, Chris doesn't want you to buy this one because <laughs> he doesn't want to lose. <laughs> Um, which is understandable, but <laughs> check it out because you should buy it. No. Um, so I'd say I, I put this card at about 500. Um, not a lot of recent comps uh, to base it on, um, but a BGS 9 sold for, I think, 700 recently. So I probably put it at 500 or so. Um, all right. Up next, we have the 1996 Ultra Full Court Trap Michael Jordan and a PSA 8. So this is the baby brother to the gold version that we were discussing earlier. And based on a recent comp for this card, I'd say this is going to go for about $200. All right, next card we have is the 1997 Skybox Premium Competitive Advantage Michael Jordan. This is in a PSA 9. Um, so this is actually pop 23 out of 70. Um, based on, uh, recent comps, I'd say that this car is going to probably fall for around $850 or so. All right. Next card up is the 1997 top season best Michael Jordan in a PSA seven. Um, these cards raw have been going for a pretty significant amount. So I'd probably put it around a hundred dollars or so that this car will go for. 
All right, next card up is the 1997 Ultra Gold Medallion, Michael Jordan, and a PSA 9. And so this is uh, the baby brother to Chris's Platinum Medallion. Um, so based on recent comps, I'd say this card is going to go for about $250. All right, next card up is the 1997 Ultra Star Power Plus Die Cut, Michael Jordan, and a BGS 9. Um, this is uh, pop 54 out of 143, and I'd say based on recent comps, uh, it, it would go for around $600. Next card up is 1997 Upper Deck Records Collection. And this is in a PSA 8. Um, based on recent comps, I'd say this will fall for about $250. Next card up is the 1997 UD3 MJ3 die cut, Michael Jordan, and that's a PSA 10. And based on recent comps, I'd say this, that card will go for about $300. The next card up is the 1998 Stadium Club Royal Court, Michael Jordan, and a PSA 9. Um, so this card is pop 35 out of 71. And I'd put the value at it at about 350 based on recent comps. All right, next card up is the 1990, 1999 Ultra 23K Gold Retirement Red Prism Foil Michael Jordan out of 9,923. And this is a PSA 8. There have not been any recent sales of this card, so I'm not really sure what it's going to go for. I'd say maybe 75 It was probably to be the ceiling on it. Um, we'll see. Um, next card up is the 1999 Upper Deck MVP Silver Script Promo Michael Jordan in a PSA 10. Um, and there's not any comps recently for this card, um, but I predict it to probably end somewhere around $150. Um, next card up is 1999 Upper Deck now showing Michael Jordan in a PSA 10, um, and I predict this card to fall at about $150 as well. So, it's quite the catalog you sent to PWCC there. The catalog, quite the catalog. Yes. Um, so, based on that, all together should turn in around. Anywhere from eight to ten thousand, maybe I don't know, based on those values. So this is the first time you've like had, like sold a nice chunk of the PC. I have never sold a nice chunk of the PC without really trying to maybe buy something else with it. Um, this is nice. I I. I I really don't mind getting rid of some of these cards because. I like giving other people the opportunity to purchase the cards and to have somebody else that's going to appreciate them more than me. Um, I just showed you my PC. You can see how many cards I did. I, I have currently still in it. Um, I have plenty of cards to look at and enjoy. <laughs> um, there's definitely uh, an opportunity here for me to kind of just put this, put these cards up for auction, and then hopefully take that and reinvest it into a different card as well. So. Uh, that's kind of my plan with it. So, Are you nervous? I think everybody would be nervous when they submit any kind of, like any kind of, like 30 cards to an auction. That's a lot. Um, I kind of knew what I was getting into when I submitted it. So I'm not necessarily nervous. I I think that at this point, the cards have already gone up so much from what I purchased them at that whatever value they land at, I'll be happy with. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily in this hobby to make money, um, but it is a nice aspect of the hobby. But with that being said, using that to, you know, reinvest and buy a grail or something like that. So that's the kind of things that I think about and kind of maybe where my next move in the hobby would be. And it's interesting time-wise because, I think it kind of falls into when you actually started getting into the the grail hunt. Hmm. Um, and you're, you know, you were about two years in and yeah. you're two and a half years in or so. And that's kind of where I'm at two and a half to three years in. So I think my, uh, my time has come to maybe make that next step. And this, <laughs> this will be a small step towards that. So, Oh, it's a big step. <laughs> you can get some really nice stuff at that level, especially if, you know, wait a little while. Yeah. Let things calm down a little bit. 
Well, I, you know, it's it's interesting because things have calmed down quite a bit already from the like these these recent comps are not the highest comps for these cards. Right. Um. You know, a month back, these cards for, were selling for much more. So that's an interesting point there, where you know, where is the right buying window? Uh, I don't know. That's up to you guys. I'm not sure. I think kind of with MJ. December. Um, well, yeah, you definitely. <laughs> By that, I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, that's that's your that's your time frame. Yeah. Take the money, maybe use it to flip some other cards, and then in December, buy Make some MJs. Yeah, that's what I would recommend. Well, thanks, Christina. You're welcome. It's not bad advice. <laughs> not at all. Okay. That he was w- going to give you a long-winded answer. I just wanted <laughs> yeah, to yeah. one Christina word. Christina got December. right to the point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, that will do it for episode 31 of the House of Jordans podcast. Thank you for tuning in, and see you guys next time. Not if you see Christina's Corner first. Oh, that's right. Christina's <laughs> hogging all the spotlight. She's hogging the corner. <laughs> I've expanded the corner. The corner has... Christina's wall now. Yeah, <laughs> Christina has has pushed out the two walls. Yes. Yes, she has. All right. I hope you guys like Brian's poster because it's sick. Chicago yeah. Bulls, yeah. six NBA championships. I love having just MJ over here to my shoulder. Yeah. Like he's like sitting on his shoulder, like guarding angel yeah. or something. Yep. Yeah. Keep like, me safe. Like a competitive angel. Just yeah. like telling you, whispering in your yeah. ear, go for the gold. Go for number six. That's, that's one thing I learned from MJ. Go for the gold. <laughs> there you go. All right. That'll do it. <laughs>